thank you for coming, and I appreciate the organizers giving me the opportunity to speak. And I want to talk to you about something that's a little different at this conference, but hopefully you guys will get interested in it, and we can talk more about it. I'm first going to tell you about the, the uh, village that puts together the, uh, the team that works on this. Uh, the funding came mostly uh, all from Aaron Dossi uh, at All Things Bugs, and he was the one that secured the funding from DARPA in order to work on this project. Um, and then Aaron and Marseille, who are in the room, and they have posters. Are they still up? Uh, so if you want to check out their posters, they're telling you what they're doing with making transgenic insects from the genomic resources that we're developing. So, um, uh, Sergey is, has, uh, and Serge is here, I know, because I saw him come in, uh, helped a lot with the uh, assemblies that you're going to see, and Tim and, and Brian were involved in the um, sequencing, actually had the, did, did the sequencing for us. So to try to speed this along, I'm going to have to talk fast because I've got too many slides, sorry about that. Uh, this young lady has been sounding the alarm for a long time about the impacts uh, on the environment and, and that we've got to do something about it. And actually, uh, a lot of world organizations are concerned about our ability to feed future populations that are projected. And we're not talking about that far in the future. Uh, within 10 years, we could be facing severe food shortages if we don't come up with a, an alternative model for agriculture. So the, the problem is uh, having a sustainable protein source for animals. And it, we're limited right now because we're not going to be able to increase the amount of land devoted to livestock. Or, uh, so we're not going to be able to meet the needs uh, for these future populations. So we've got to start thinking outside of the box now in order to meet that demand. And uh, the other problem that maybe you haven't thought about is that three-fourths of your food comes from just 12 plant and five animal species. That is a real problem on diversity, and if you had included insects in that picture, uh, we have a couple of thousand that we could work on and try to diversify your, your, um, your food crops. So why insects? Insects make a good model for protein production. They are highly efficient. They require less food less uh, input water, and they take up less land. Uh, in fact, a lot of insect farms are, are rearing insects vertically now. So um, they, they just make a, a good alternative source. Uh, and then getting back to uh, Greta's uh, problem, uh, insects are much better at, at reducing the amount of, of CO2 that's uh, emitted. And in fact, since these uh, farms are, are reared, um, it, it contained, you, you could see that you could actually push that down to zero emissions uh, or close to it. So insects are a great alternative food source, uh, and, but just like regular livestock production, you need the genetic resources in order to make these insects better for the, for the crops, uh, for the, um, the applications that we're trying to develop them for that are needed. And so I've done, I started working on this when I, uh, so we're, we're going to go a little nostalgia since uh, this is our 20th anniversary. I started coming to this meeting at, I think it was 2007. And at that meeting, I learned how to sequence and why to sequence. And I learned that it was kind of fun to do this kind of, kind of work. And it helped to propel me forward and, and to be able to answer a lot of questions that I wanted to answer. But it's been an evolution, just like you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the people here that have started out sequencing on different platforms. We now uh, use long read sequencing and scaffold, um, and we've uh, been very successful using dovetail scaffolding. Uh, and in fact, we're going to be uh, annotating these gen genomes through uh, dovetail as well. So um, this is an example of how quickly the technology is advancing because um, maybe a year, maybe a little bit more ago, we, we, we had developed a really good method to extract long uh, genomic DNA that's, that's high quality. And we had been sequencing mostly on the RS2 and we've been getting good results, 
but we have, for the insects that I'm going to show you today, um, uh, most of them have been sequenced uh, on the SQL1. And we got, uh, uh, this is a red flower beetle. It's a, another insect that, that I study that I'm not going to talk about much today. Uh, but we had used four smart cells and got 150x coverage. But when the SQL2 came out, we took the same library uh, prep and sequenced it on the SQL2 and got 350x coverage with just one smart cell. So we were really happy with that, and we were like, okay, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is going to really accelerate what we do as far as genome uh, assembly because the, the long reads are absolutely essential for insects that are, have high repeat, repeat structure. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Some of these insects have high heterozygosity, especially the crickets that I'll talk about today. And these are the assembly stats for the six genomes that I've been working on. Rhizopertha dominica is a less grain borer. It is the first insect that we attempted to sequence, and it is the best. I guess it's beginner's luck, but it uh, is our gold standard now. It's, it's assembled essentially to chromosome level, and you can see the BUSCO scores look good, and so we're, we're trying to push that one out right now. The three in yellow are the ones that we're working on for insects as food. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you first about uh, the millworm, and I talked about that two years ago, so I'm going to just gloss over that one, and then I'll talk to you more about the crickets, because that's the new data. And those are the uh, draft assemblies in the scaffolds. Um, so the millworm uh, genome has been a challenge. And um, if it wasn't for surge, we'd probably still be trying to assemble this thing, because um, it, it took a lot of CPU and a lot of effort. And after a while, uh, he told me, this, this genome is not like the others. There, there's something really wrong with it. And the really wrong thing is these satellites. And when we went back to the literature, we found out that these satellites are 60% of the genome. And they are 142 nucleotides long, but they are less than 2% um, diverged, and they also are in every chromosome, and when I blasted one of the PacBio long reads, I could see it's just peppered throughout that long read. So that's why we were having problems uh, getting this thing assembled. Still, we got a, a decent uh, scaffolded genome, although uh, the BUSCO scores look good, but uh, only about 50% of that uh, is assembled, and the rest of it is those highly repetitive regions. So we are talking about can we do better, and I think we can, so we're going to uh, try with the PacBio HiFi reads because we think that, that using the HiFi reads and combining it with Dovetail's new OmniC uh, scaffolding that we can actually get through some of these repeat regions. So stay tuned on that one. But what I really want to talk to you about today is the crickets because the crickets really, we thought they would be the hardest to assemble because they're two gig genomes, they're big, they're highly heterozygous. And um, we felt like that this would be the real challenge, but they actually went to, together pretty nicely. So we've got some good assemblies. They're scaffolded essentially to chromosome level and some big um, um, scaffolds. And, and actually, I plotted the scaffolds so that you could see. These are essentially the 11 largest scaffolds in, in each genome, and we're comparing it to that, that gold standard, that R lesser grain board genome. And if you add up the BUSCO scores, or if you do just run a BUSCO on those 11, you'll see that we've got pretty, fairly decent BUSCO scores. So we've, we've, you know, we've got a good assembly. We can go ahead and start working with it, which we have. Uh, we've been uh, using Kraken to just, to just to do a quick screen on scaffolds to see if scaffolds might uh, be actually not scaffolded crickets, but scra scaffolded managed genomic sequences. And we see that, yes, in fact, about half of the sequences in um, the banded cricket, which is the GSI, uh, are metagenomic sequences, mostly bacteria. And in the uh, house cricket, which is ADO, they have even more metagenomic uh, scaffolds. About three-fourths of the scaffolds are metagenomic, probably. And a lot, a lot of virus sequences in that insect, and that was really interesting to us. Because the whole reason that we did this project was to compare the uh, banded cricket, which is virus resistant uh, to a, a really nasty virus that decimates the house cricket populations, it's the denzivirus, 
and it, um, when farmers uh, in the U.S. started losing their, their uh, cricket farms, the house crickets, they substituted the banded cricket. It looks like maybe the banded cricket has some inherent virus resistance embedded in the genome, and we're going to be looking for that um, to see if we can detail that a little bit more. The other thing that we noticed is that the cricket uh, genes overall were huge in comparison to uh, our beetle genes. And so I just took the Busco reference genes and just plotted um, those for the, uh, that, the house cricket and the, and the uh, banded cricket compared to our beetle uh, tribolium. And you can see that uh, the fold difference is very large, in some cases really, really large. And um, you, you see there's really no concordance between the house cricket and the banded cricket. They look, you know, um, they're, they're kind of, they're large, but they're not all consistent. Uh, and so we know that from another orthopteran, um, a locust, that that genome is even larger. And 60% of that genome is transposable elements. And they did a study looking at uh, and found that the, uh, the amount of uh, transposable elements in genomes is positively correlated to uh, genome size. So maybe that's part of the reason. Uh, but what I did is I extracted the intron sequences um, from the uh, crickets, and then I put them through repeat modeler to see, it, are these all transposable elements, or what is actually in these introns? And what we found was about half of them, and this is pretty consistent throughout our insect genomes, is that there are repeat sequences, but they're not classified yet. So we've got some work to do on trying to understand uh, what these repeats are. But the others are um, of, of three different types, and if you drill down on that and you look at the, um, and you said that this probably wouldn't work so well. Just look at the top. Uh, that, that one is the, the most um, copy numbers that you find, uh, and they are line, and you probably can't read that, but it's line and RTE um, both B. And looking at RTE both V, uh, that has uh, been first reported in mammals, and I think that's where the name comes from, bovine. But actually, it's been proposed that they came from insects, and our data would support that, that probably um, those repeat sequences are, are ancient. Uh, but you can see that the, 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 the copy number is very similar in both of these crickets, and that also supports that it came from an ancient ancestor. So I wanted to end with uh, a paper that has actually been embargoed and is going to be available in the next few hours. Exciting. I've never had a paper embargoed. Uh, and it is uh, of the transcriptome sequencing that we did in the, um, in the house cricket. And that um, we took th uh, different developmental stages because we wanted to look at gene expression across the developmental stages, but we also wanted to use that information for annotating the genome. Um, and so we did a blast of, and, th and we did this before we had the genome, so we used contigs from the transcriptome assembly. And we blasted those contigs, and we found that in one case, we had a lot of contigs that were hitting a gregarine. And actually, gregarines are described in crickets and mealworms, and it seems that just by looking at the scaffolds that we were able to determine that this, um, these cricket, this cricket in particular had these gregarines. And so you can dig into the data and actually get things um, uh, by using some of these other methods. Now, we wanted to look at what the expression, what pattern was of these gregarines over the developmental stages. And it was interesting that in the embryos and the one-day hatchlings, you don't see much expression. But when we took the first feeding stage, which, which was one-week nymphs, they really accelerated uh, the expression of these gregarines. So it seems to be correlated with that. And it, it, uh, it's highly expressed over time and also highly expressed in females, but not so much in males. And we did find a paper that says that um, the the Gregorian load in uh, cricket, and these other crickets, but they were related crickets, uh, is negatively correlated to the uh, Gregorian load um, to the sp spermatophores. So maybe that's connected to this, I don't know. 
Uh, we also looked at uh, gene ontology analysis, and we found that uh, there were a lot of genes correlating with antibiotics. One of them was prolixacin. Uh, that was first uh, described in the kissing bug, and it has antibacterial properties. And so we looked at genome expression of that, and it was very similar. We saw low expression. There was one contig that was expressed constitutively, but low expression pretty much in the embryos and the hatchlings, and then more expression, a very high expression ramps up when they start feeding, which makes some sense. So I'm going to close with just some take-home messages that we've gotten from these studies thus far, and that is, I think I've... Uh, uh, made the case that long, reach, long read and long range uh, uh, sequencing is essential for good genome assemblies. Um, the cricket genes are similar to the or other orthoptera in that they're big, and that's because of uh, big introns. And the um, uh, Kraken, just sc screening your scaffolds with Kraken can give you some information on the metagenome uh, that you may find within your sequences. And hopefully, uh, all three of us have tried to convince you that this kind of work is really essential for providing alternative uh, protein sources uh, for the future. So I'll end there and take a few questions.